Hey, what is up, Anchor Church? My name is Albert Estevez. I am so excited to be here with you this morning. If we haven't had the pleasure to meet, I cannot wait for you to come into our building, come check us out. We have two services live at 11.45 and 1.30. But for those of you that have chosen to stay home, we appreciate you. We thank you for following us on YouTube. And if you are, make sure you subscribe, make sure you're commenting, make sure you're liking, make sure you're engaging, and make sure you're sharing. Share with other people, make sure everybody else is getting involved. We love for the, for the word, for the gospel to be shared. Um, this week, we're actually starting a new series. It's called 2190. We are so excited for it. Pastor Sean has an amazing word. So with all that being said, let's see what he has to say. And y'all know what? I know it's gonna be a good Sunday. Do you know how I know it's gonna be a good Sunday? Because every Sunday, something technical goes wrong. I'm telling you, it's like right before service, they're saying, oh, the projector over and overflow isn't working. But I'm telling you, it is every Sunday, Wi-Fi went out like in the whole area last Sunday so we couldn't connect online. And it makes me laugh because every single time I think the devil goes, <laughs> I got you. We're like, nope, we still had like 15 people get saved last weekend. So come on, let's just give some praise to Jesus. He deserves the praise, all the glory, all the credit, all the honor. God, thank you so much for how you're working in our church. Thank you that, Father God, no matter what happens, you are still in control. You are still on your throne. God, we're so grateful. We are overwhelmed today by your presence. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak through me in a mighty way. I pray that every single watch, uh, person watching online over an overflow, God, would you just work through the hearts of your people? Man, God, we love you so much. I'm thankful that today you are our everything. And it's in your name we pray. And somebody shouted. Come on, Anchor Church, if you love Jesus again, one more time, just let him know it. Listen, I, I told y'all last week, um, for right now, we're in this season of, of wearing masks. And I'm gonna tell you, like, like I'm, I'm not a fan of wearing the mask. We're doing the, the mask thing because it's, it's protecting you and me and all that kind of stuff. But the day that we're not wearing masks, it's gonna be a great day. I cannot wait for the day when this room is packed with people and we're not socially distanced and we don't have a bunch of people over an overflow having to, to work with. Is that me? What's going on here with the echo? I'm gonna keep talking until that goes away. As I told you, there's this technical stuff is going on, but we're not gonna, the devil is not gonna win. I'm telling you right now. If that keeps doing it, Floyd, let me know and I will just put down this mic and I will yell because I'm not gonna deal with that for the next 30 minutes. We're figuring it out right now. Okay, we're still, we're still, Okay, it sounds like a little bit better. If it gets echoey, honey, just let me know and I will scream. I'll blow my lungs out before we'll deal with that. So I'm so glad you're with us today, but uh, I, I'm so excited for the day when this room is completely packed out and overflow doesn't exist and we are slammed and it's gonna be a cool thing when we're able to worship and I can see your smiling faces. There's, there's nothing worse than preaching to a bunch of people with a mask on. It's the, it's the worst. But I'm gonna tell you this. We are still a new church. We just celebrated our one year anniversary last Sunday. How awesome, one year. So even though we are Anchor Church and there is so much about us that you already know, there's so much DNA that's already been created, we are still creating the culture of who we are. And here's the culture of who we are. We are a church that verbally responds to the message. What that means is this, you can clap, you can say amen, you can say what, what, you can say preach it, whatever you wanna do, but it's a way for us to stay engaged with each other, because here's why. I'm telling you, the more verbally engaged you are in the message, the more you'll actually retain through the message. And I did not grow up in a church where you clapped or spoke or said amen during the message. I did not, because a lot of people go, I just don't know how to do that. I didn't grow up in that. That was not, I did not grow up in that era. If you clapped or said amen during a sermon, they'd escort you out and try to cast a demon out. That was just the way it worked. That was, that was, the, that was the church I grew up in. That was, but that is not who we are, Anchor Church. We laugh, we, if you hear a joke that you think is kind of funny, you laugh really loudly. Because the mask covers, what are you laughing for, babe? You, an example? Oh, thanks, sweetheart, I appreciate that so much. Hey, we're starting a brand new series today that I titled 2190. 2190. And I talk to so many people who say, Sean, I don't understand this, this number thing you, you're doing here, this, this 2190. I, I, I don't get it. 
One of our core values as a church is to pursue Jesus passionately. We want to pursue Jesus passionately. The whole thing about giving your heart to Jesus Christ, it's like, man, I've given my heart to Christ, and now I'm saved, and I've got a place in heaven, which is awesome. But now every single day, God is working in me and through me to be more like Jesus. And how do you become more like Jesus? By pursuing him, to talking to him, reading his word, giving, serving. You become more like Jesus every single day when you passionately follow him and chase after him in every way possible. And I want to focus on that during the next few weeks of this series, 2190. This is the premise behind this series. In your life, we know that it takes 21 days to create a habit. Scientists would tell you it takes 21 days to create a habit but it takes another 90 days to make it permanent in your life. 21 days sets a pattern. 90 days makes it permanent. And too many people in this life have stopped after 21 days and you haven't made it permanent in your life. Working out, dieting. So many people get, I'm gonna diet for 21 days, but if you continue for 90, how about if you don't just diet, how about if you make a decision in how you eat? How about if we make a decision and not just working out for 21 days, but making exercise a part of your life? How about if we actually, instead of just reading the Bible for 21 days, actually did it for 90 days, and the Bible became a permanent thing in our life? See, so many people, what happens is they go to church not based on habit, but based on tradition. Habit says, I'm establishing this in my life because I see the importance of it. Tradition says, my family did it, so I'll go. Too many people come to church because of tradition. It's not your faith, it's your parents' faith. But this is not a church of tradition. This is a church where you need to make it a habit and you go, I'm going to church because I wanna know more about God, I wanna serve God, I wanna love God, I wanna give, and I wanna be a part of what God's doing, 2190. I want that pattern to become permanent. Uh, this is kind of the, the theme verse that I have for this series. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter two, says this, dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard, somebody say work hard. Work hard, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Notice, you're not working for salvation. Jesus gave you that on the cross when he died for your sins and you gave your heart to him. You're not earning your salvation, but what you are do is working in such a way that people look at you and go, they're different. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you. Somebody say working in you. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If God is working in you, that means he's not done with you. It doesn't say, for God is done working in you. What does it say? God is working in you. God is working in you from the moment he, the moment you gave your life to Christ, he's working in you. There's a, a big church word called sanctification. What that means is he's working inside of you, making him more like his son, Jesus. How do you then show the results? Work hard. Notice Paul doesn't say in Philippians, it's easy work. Giving your heart to Christ is easy. Living it out, a little more difficult. You work hard, 2190. You work hard, why? Because you wanna make it a permanent thing in your life. You wanna pursue Jesus, 2190, and make that pattern permanent in your life. Have you ever noticed why it's so easy in life to, like, um, to do harmful things, but it's so hard to do helpful things? Anyone ever notice that? Like, why when you're dieting is it so much easier to drive through the McDonald's drive through than cut some carrot sticks and have hummus? You know what I'm talking about? Why is it so stinking difficult? I'm just like, whenever I'm dieting, I mean, I, have you ever done that before where you're, you're, you're prepping your meals? Therein lies the problem. You have to prep your meals. I don't want to prep a meal. I just want to go cook a meal. I talk to people, what are you doing on Sunday? Oh, I'm prepping my meals for the week. Got to get my chicken and my Brussels sprouts and my kale and my basmati rice. 
It is so much easier to just go grab a Snickers. You ever notice that? It, it's so hard. Do you know why? It is so hard to do the right thing. It is so hard to do the right thing. Aristotle said this, we are what we repeatedly do. So many of us today are, are in a bad place in life, but you've gotten yourself in a bad place in life because you've repeatedly done bad things. But Paul says work hard. And I want over the next few weeks for us to talk about what this looks like to pursue Jesus in our life. What, what does it look like to actually truly follow Christ with everything that we have, pursue him passionately, 2190? And over the next few weeks, I want to talk about some certain areas where we're going to grow as followers of Christ. Today, I want to talk about the importance of studying the Bible. Some of you are like, oh, exciting. I came to church on the right day, studying the Bible. Whoa. But I know this for a fact. If I was to jump off of this stage, I would fall to the ground. It's called gravity. We all know that to be true. If I was to ask three people to stand right there and I was to jump into their arms, I wouldn't float over them. I would fall into them. We all agree with that. We go, yes, pastor, it's called gravity. We learned that a long time ago. And I'm telling you this, you cannot, beyond a shadow of a doubt, grow in your relationship with Christ without getting into the word of God. You can't. Some people say, it's, it's osmosis. I sleep with it next to my head. It does nothing. It doesn't work like that. You got to get in it to be like it. You have to. And this is the point of this series. Who you are is determined by two things. Number one, the commitments that you make. And number two, the habits that you keep. Bottom line. So what habits are you creating? What commitments are you making? When it comes to areas of growth in your life, I wrote a few areas down. Listen, when you are born, you are intended to grow. That's the whole point. You, you, you grow. Some areas we grow in. We grow intellectually. Do you know how you grow intellectually? By studying skills. That's how you get, that's how you, remember when you're a kid and your parents say, hey, go study. Why would they have you study? Because you're developing your brain. You're growing your smarts. How do you do that? Through studying. You are intended to remain the same. You're intended to grow intellectually. You're intended to grow socially. This is what we call people skills. Why in the world would I need to grow socially, Sean? Well, so that when your boss gets mad at you, you don't yell at him, punch him in the face, and go home. You're developing social skills. When our son was little, I would say, Austin, shake their hand. Shake their hand, son. Why are we doing that? So that when you become older and you get to be 23, you don't meet somebody go, like, we're teaching you people skills, right? What about emotional skills? We call these process, emotional growth, processing skills. We have physical growth. How do you get this? By working out and nutrition skills. But you also have spiritual areas of growth. How do you grow spiritually? By godly pursuit skills. Spiritual growth just doesn't happen. Spiritual growth just doesn't happen. You get into the word. You pray. You give. You serve. You follow Christ with everything you have. That's how you grow spiritually. My, 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 our son and our daughter, right? My son, he's been married for two years. My daughter, two, th going on three years. My daughter's been married going on two years. And, and my kids will say this to us. My kids will say, you guys, you and mom, you have the best marriage. You guys have the best marriage. Like, how does that just happen? That doesn't just happen. That's 24 years of work on a relationship to make that marriage happen. So what you see from afar is, man, that's just so good. But what you don't see is the work that went into making it so good. You ever seen somebody that has like a great relationship with Christ? And you go, man, I wonder how that happened. I'll tell you straight up how that happened. They jumped into the word of God. They jumped into prayer. They dove into worship. Come on. 2190. Don't look from afar and say, man, I wish I had that. Jump in and go, I'm getting that. This is that series, 2190. I'm growing myself spiritually. It's all about you turning something that's a pattern into being something permanent. You don't wake up on Sunday and go, will I go to church today? After 90 days, you're going, no, I'm going to church today. 
I might lift my hands into worship after 90 days. You're like, oh no, straight up, I'm all in on this song. I don't know the words. I don't know how to sing Spanish, but I'm going after it in Jesus' name. Cristo, Cristo, let's go. We're jumping in. We're going in after it. Why? Because that's the church we want to be. That's the church we are. Psalm 19 says this, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. Some of us go, I don't want to read the Bible. The Bible's boring. My Bible says right there in Psalm 19, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. Some of us feel like we have a dead soul. Get in the Bible and watch it revive your soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commands of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. Who doesn't want to read God's word? The commands of the Lord are clear, giving sight, insight for living. I'm like right there. Look at that. I've got joy. I've got my heart is overflowing. The ways of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living, making me have wise decisions. The trustworthy ways of the Lord. Who doesn't want to be in the word of God? So many of us look at the word of God as being boring. It's a textbook. It's not a textbook. It's a love letter. How do you read it? How do you read it? Let me talk about why we study the Bible. Anybody want to know what, why we study the Bible? I wrote down some reasons why we study the Bible. We, we study the Bible to understand God's character. To understand God's character. People always ask me this, Pastor, what is God like? Does anyone ever ask you, like, what, what, what is God like? Which is interesting because all I, all I know about God is what I know of God what I studied of God, but so many people base their mindset on God not on what they study, but what other people have said. There are people say, well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to Anchor Church. Have you been to Anchor Church? No, no, no. I had a friend that went, said the music was too loud. <laughs> Have you been to Anchor Church? No, 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 no. So how would you know if the music's too loud? Well, they said. Oh, maybe you have different listening skills, right? I mean, look, think about this right now. You cannot turn on the TV right now without seeing a political ad. Biden, Trump, it, it, like you cannot turn on the TV right now and you'll, you'll hear Biden, da, 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 Trump, da, da, da. Like it's, it's all over the place. And you'll watch something, I'll talk to people, do, do you like Biden? Oh, I can't stand Biden. Do you like Trump? I can't stand Trump. Well, do, do you know them? No, but the, the media says this and they never lie. No, I'm, I'm just saying, well, this is not a political sermon. This is the idea of, but have you done the research on Biden and Trump yourself? Yeah. This, this is what I know about, in, in, our, in our married life, Teresa will never, it doesn't matter. She will not vote for anybody until she's done her research. I'm talking days of research. She will research Democrat, Republican, Independent. She will research all, and she'll come to me, this person, da, 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 this. And so I know when she's voting, she has done her due diligence on every single person. And somebody said to Teresa, well, I hate that person. She goes, well, did you know that they did this 10 years ago? Bah, 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 bah. So I like their, I'm, I'm like, how, how do you know that, babe? Because I studied it. The reason why I bring this up is this. So many people hate a political person based on what the media says. So many people hate God on what somebody else has said. So many people will never give God a chance because someone else was dealt a bad hand in life and blamed God. And so all of a sudden, what happened to them is now God's fault. Well, my Bible says my God came to make things better in my life, not worse in my life. <laughs> Some people say this. I'm not, well, you know what, the anchor church, I, listen, can I just be honest with you as your pastor? I am going to let you down. Like some of you, I've already let you down. You're like, how could he preach in that shirt and those tight pants? I can't understand. <laughs> I mean, some of you already walked in like, I just don't base what you see in me on the God of the universe. <laughs> Churches will hurt you. Don't base the loving Father's love for you on a church hurt. Don't stop going somewhere because you got burnt by somebody trusting the God that loves you unconditionally. But how would you know that if you didn't study that? Do you want to know what God is like? We see the picture of God through Jesus. John chapter 14, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him because you've seen me. So many of us want to know what God is like then how about you do this? Study your Bible. 
where do I start? Man, you need to read the Gospel of John. It's in the New Testament, close to the end of the Bible. Read through the whole, and I'm telling you this, so many people will say this to me, well, pastor, I, I, I tried to read through the Bible one time, and I started at the beginning in Genesis, I got to Leviticus, I got to like seven days on the 13th month of the, the fourth ram, and I just got so bored. Don't start there. I don't like reading Leviticus. I know you won't like reading Leviticus. How about if you read the Gospel of John and try reading five verses a day? Why would it be so important to read the Gospel of John? Because you'll see the life of Jesus and you'll see that Jesus is a perfect image of God and how loving he is, how grace-filled he is, how caring he is, how he meets the needs of people, how he's a healer, how he's a saver, how he's a forgiver. Would you ever know that? So many people go, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand God. Get in the word of God and begin to understand who he is through the person of his son, Jesus. Don't take someone else's word for it. You focus on it. I want to understand the word of God. That's why I, I study scripture. You know what else? I, I want, why I read the Bible is to, to understand who God is, but the other reason is to know God's ways. Anybody want to know God's ways? I, I do. I, I, want to, I, want to know, I want to know God's ways. And do you know the character of God is to help direct you in your path? God just didn't create you and send you to planet Earth for you to go, what should I do? I'm so confused. God goes, read my word, and all of a sudden, I bring clarity to your confusion. Some of us are so confused right now because we don't know what to do, but we haven't opened the word of God in months. The Bible says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Notice it doesn't say a spotlight. Do you know what many of us want? We want a spotlight to see three years in the future. God, if you could just show me three years in the future, who will I marry? Where will I live? What job will I make? God, how much will I make? What, what, what will I, God, what will I do? Show me three years in the future. And God goes, I'm not gonna show you three years. I told you I'd give you a lamp to your feet to watch where you tread. And I'm gonna be a light for your path for you to see how you travel. Do you know, I, I might have told you this, but inevitably when you get older, you have to get up and go to the bathroom in, in the middle of the night. It's just one of those glorious things. It's a joy. It's a joy. And I used to get up and just walk to the dark because I knew the vicinity of where the bathroom was. Anybody ever just wake up in the middle of the night and just kind of like do one of these things? <laughs> By a show of hands, can I get a witness? Is it just me? Like you know where to go. Right, you know the vicinity, but you wake up and be like, I know there's a bed right there. Ah, there's a bed right there. You done that before? <laughs> Caught it in the hip, and what happened to be just like this little instance of you getting up to the bathroom is now turned in like, I've got to repent of my sins because of it, you know what I'm talking about? You said some things like, oh dear Lord, that was not appropriate. <laughs> so now, what I do now is, I open up my cell phone, because you know how the cell phone kind of like glows? And I don't turn the light on, I just have the glow. You know what I'm talking about? Because I know the vicinity of the bathroom, but I've stepped on the dog too many times. I stubbed my toe on the bed, right? I've actually stubbed my toe and broke it on the dog, fell over, laying there going, oh, dear Jesus. And Teresa wakes up and goes, is the dog okay? <laughs> so because, of, that is a true story. So because of that, I wake up and I have the glow of my phone. Why? Because I know the vicinity, but I don't want to step on anything that'll hurt me. Yeah. I don't want to stub my toe. I want to see clearly the path. And too many of us right now are walking through life like this. Should I date him, Lord? Should I date him? I mean, I know the vicinity of you is over there, but should I keep that job? Should I continue to go? I, instead, God goes, open my word up. Study my word. Trust in my word because life was not created for you to go like this. Yeah. It was created for you to do this. I can see. Okay, I know God's over there, but I'm going to make sure I don't step on something that will blow up. I want to make sure that I'm. Why not jump in the word of God? You can understand God's character. You can know God's word. But do you know why else I read the word of God? Why you should read the word of God? Why this should be a 2190 thing? It's because you and I want to hear God's voice. Anyone want to hear the voice of God? 
So many people go, is it, Sean, when you talk to God, is it an audible voice? What does he sound like? I've told you before, God sounds a lot like me, but with a whole lot more wisdom. It's a heart voice. It's a whisper. The Bible is the megaphone of God. And when you begin to open God's word and read God's word, he begins to speak clearly to your heart. I've been driving down the road before, and God put someone in my heart like that, boom, and I'll call them, and they'll go, I can't believe you called me, Pastor. I'm going through such a difficult time. How'd you know? God told me. I wouldn't have known that had I not been in God's word and known his character and known his heart and known my path and know his direction and known his voice. Many of us want God to yell at us, but he won't yell at you because you're too far away. We serve a God of the whisper. Why would I ever whisper to you? Because I'm close to you when I whisper. If I can yell, you can be over there and hear me, but God doesn't want you over there to hear him. He wants you right here so he can whisper in your ear. That's what God wants. Do you, do you know, the other day, the other day I, I was in the kitchen. Teresa was still, she was, she was laying in bed. I was trying to be quiet. I was making coffee. And I said to our Alexa in the kitchen, right? I said, uh, Alexa, I was trying to talk softly. Put on some worship music. It freaked me out. Alexa goes, I noticed you whispered. Would you like me to go into whisper mode? That's straight up demonic, bro. I was like, no. And she responds and goes, okay. I'm like, wow. But it, it's interesting to me that she knew I was close. So many of us are so far away and you can't hear the voice of God and you're just going, God, would you yell? And God goes, I don't want to yell. Because if I yell, you can stay at a distance, but I don't want you at a distance. I want you close. I want you close. And how do I speak to you in a close fashion when you're in my word? I can talk to you like this when it's just you and me. Don't have music playing. Don't have TV going because there's something I want to say to you. And I, I love that the Bible in 2 Timothy says all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong. How cool is it? The Bible is the inspired word of God. You're reading the words of God. He inspired through other people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to write certain things. And when you read the Bible, you're reading the words of God. Let it speak to you. 2190. I want to know God. I want to know his voice. I want to understand his character. But do you know why else you and I should read the word of God? Because it will deepen our faith. Do you know you weren't created to stay shallow in your faith? You were created to go deep in your faith. Acts 20 says this, and now I entrust to you God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up. Somebody say build you up. The word of God is meant to build you up and give you an inheritance for all those who he has set apart for himself. To build you up, to give you a reward. God does not want you staying shallow. He wants to deepen you in your trust for him. How many of you have ever been in a swimming pool before? You know, there's a shallow end, and there's a, a deep end. When I did swimming lessons for the first time in my life when I was a kid, the whole point is for them to teach you skills in case you were to ever fall into the... Because in the shallow end, I could stand. I don't need instruction. I don't need a teacher because I'm good to go. And so they teach you instruction so that when you go into the deep end, the deep end requires you to have some instruction so you can stay afloat. But in the deep end, it's so much better. You ever been snorkeling in an inch of water? No, man. I want to go deep, don't you? You see the cool stuff in the deep. But you got to follow the instructions to stay afloat in the deep end. So many of us in our faith, we love the shallow end. This is so good. And God goes, I didn't create you for that. Because here you can stand on your own. I don't want you standing on your own. I want you down here where you know I got you. And that only deepens in your soul. How do you get something to be deeper? You have to dig something out. 
What the Bible does for you is it digs out the parts of you. God goes, I don't need that to do my work. Let me dig that out of you and put more of me in so you can get out of the shallow end and trust me in the deep end that I got you because right now you're trying to stand in 20 foot of water and it doesn't work. The word of God deepens. It builds up. The last thing I want you to understand about the Bible is this. We read it to let it change our lives. It changes your lives. Hebrews 4 says this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between spirit and soul, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost desires and thoughts. How cool is that? He says the Bible's like, it's like a sword. How many of you like today, before you left, if I stabbed you, you'd remember it? <laughs> I'm never coming back to this church ever. You'd probably have an emotional effect. You'd have a physical effect, and you would never forget it. Why would I say that? Because that's what the writer of Hebrews says the Bible should do in your life. It should cut you to the place where it changes you, and you never forget it. I've been stabbed by the word of God, and I will never forget how it made me feel. I will never forget that it changed my life. I will never forget that it changed the way I think. I will never forget it. It's made a difference in me. I was telling Teresa, I found this story on the internet. It's pretty incredible. The story of the, the, the Prince of Grenada. And, and the Prince of Grenada was next in line for the throne. The king was afraid he was gonna try to overthrow his power. So the king had the Prince of Grenada thrown in prison. He was in prison for 33 years and the only book he was given while he was in prison was the Bible. Complete solitary reading the Bible. And it says this, the Prince of Grenada was heir to the Spanish crown. He was sentenced to a life in solitary confinement in Madrid's ancient prison called the Place of the Skull. It says the, the fearful, dirty, and dreary nature of the place earned it its name. Everyone knew that once you were in, you'd never come out alive. The prince was given one book to read the entire time, the Bible, with only one book to read. He read it over and over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of times. This book became his constant companion. And after 33 years of imprisonment, he died. When they came in to clean out his cell, they found some notes he had written using a nail to mark some soft stone in the prison walls. The notations were this. Psalm 118.8 is the middle verse of the entire Bible. Ezra 7.21 contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. The ninth verse in the eighth chapter of Esther is the longest verse in the Bible. No name or word that has more than six syllables exists in the Bible. The Prince of Grenada became basically like a, a Bible trivia expert, but here's the crazy thing, but he never gave his heart to Christ. He knew the Bible forward and backward for 33 years, but he never let it change him. He knew it, but he didn't know God through it. So many of us today have a Bible, but it does no good sitting on your phone or sitting on your shelf. 2190, it's time to jump into the Word. It's time to jump into the Word of God. Be consistent, be focused. Let it get into you in such a powerful way that it actually changes you. Just don't read it, live it. 2190, let this pattern of reading God's word become permanent in your life and watch it change your life as you understand God, as you hear God, as you know God, as you follow God, as you see God, as you listen for God, and as God changes your life, watch what you begin to do. Come on, stand your feet with me. Did I get anybody excited about reading the word of God? I want to encourage you. I think somebody needs this word today. I think so many times we, we read the word of God and think it's all about quantity. I've got to read 14 chapters. I disagree. It's all about quality. I'd rather read two verses and know it than 20 verses and have no idea what I read. I spent a full year of my life one time just on reading the Beatitudes. I, I just, I, I'm telling you, just be encouraged. If you read two verses tomorrow, that's probably more than you read today. 
Just read the Word of God. Focus on the Word of God. Let it get in you. 2190. Learn to love that Bible. But you know, it all begins. It all begins with a relationship with Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what the Bible is all about. Beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is all about how you and I made mistakes. We tried to earn back some trust and love and, and salvation and forgiveness on our own, but we couldn't do it, so Jesus had to come do it for us. That's the message of the gospel. That's the whole Bible. And if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, you've been trying to dig yourself out of a past that you just can't dig yourself out of, good news, my friend, it's time to stop digging and put down the shovel and just give your heart over to Christ and call on salvation. If you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, that's where it all begins. September 20th, 1980, I prayed this prayer to give my heart to Jesus Christ, and I've never been the same. The Bible says he comes into your heart, makes everything new. Your old life is gone. You have new life in Christ. And if you're here today and you want to pray that exact same prayer I prayed September 20th, 1980, you might say, Sean, include me in that prayer because I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to be bold in just a second. I want you to just raise your hand and count to three. It right, doesn't matter who's next to you. This is, the, this is not a tradition. This is between you and God. This is a commitment you're making. And if you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer, but you want to, on the count of three, just raise your hand. One, two, three. Just raise your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Raise it up. Yeah. 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 Hey, we're all going to pray this prayer together. But if you're joining us online right now, you're in this room, you just pray it a little bit louder if you raised your hand, okay? Come on, bow your heads. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, today I'm giving you my heart. Today I'm surrendering my life to you. Today I'm surrendering my life to you. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. And make me a brand new person. Make me a brand new person. And as best as I know how. And as best as I know how. For the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus name. Amen. Hey, come on, can we give it up for all those that prayed that prayer? The Bible says there's a party in heaven for you, and we celebrate with you. Come on, Anchor Church, lift your hands. Let's begin to fill this place with worship. Come on. Man, I don't know about you, but I got to get my life together. I learned so many things today about what I can start applying into my life just to get better each and every day. That's what it's about, starting something, right? So if, if, if this message has done the same for you, please share, subscribe to our channel, like it, comment on it on facebook too thank you for joining us make sure you're sharing it let's get the word out again we'll be here next week at 11:45 and 1:30. we would love it if you came into our building bring your mask we'll see you then